shield. In the King James Version Bible, there are several words that are utilized that all mean shield. <clears throat> a buckler was a small shield normally held in the left hand by a leather strap attached to the back of the shield. A buckler was used to fend off the blows of an enemy in very close combat. A target was also utilized in the King James Version Bible for a smaller type of shield. Now the larger shields were often utilized to, it means the, the, the word actually means a shield of the largest type. And the larger shields were utilized to, for example, fend off arrows uh, shot by an archer at greater distances. Shields in biblical times were basically all made the same way. They were formed uh, out of wood and then covered with another substance, a variety of substances. Many of them were covered with leather, uh, brass, copper was another popular covering for the shields. And shields that were utilized, uh, for example, in the king's court uh, ceremonially uh, were often covered in precious metals, such as gold. On a spiritual level, the best shield for our defense against our enemies is our Heavenly Father. If you love and trust in your Heavenly Father, you can depend on Him to fend off anything that the enemy is able to throw at you, including the fiery darts of Satan. Open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 15 as we begin our study uh, entitled Shield. <clears throat> we learn several promises that were made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. Let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Genesis chapter 15, verse 1, and it reads, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Now, after these things, what we're talking about in the preceding chapter, Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God, appeared to Abram, and Abraham gave his tithes to him. Abram, as you all know, was Abraham's name before God changed his name, Abraham, meaning father of many nations. Now this word shield is magain, in magain, I should say, in the Hebrew, and it means protector. Now, when God is your protector, there is nothing for you to fear. Absolutely nothing for you to fear. Verse 2 and Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. You see, in verse 1, God said, Thy exceeding great reward. I am thy exceeding great reward. Abraham saying, Lord, I don't have anybody that's my heir except this steward that was born in my house. Where are all the children that you promised me, Lord? And Abram said, Behold to me thou hast given no seed. Doesn't matter how much you give me as an inheritance, I don't have anyone to give the inheritance to. And lo, one born in my house is mine heir, the steward Eliezer. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, this shall not be thine heir. Your steward, Eliezer, is not going to be your heir. But he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. Abraham was 99 years old at this time. Sarah 
was 90 years old. And God is talking promises of children. And another place God would say, in Isaac will thy name be called. Through Isaac, umbilical cord to umbilical cord, century through the centuries, down to Messiah was born as a result of Isaac. And he brought him forth abroad. He took Abraham outside, and we're going to learn it was at night, and said, look now toward heaven and tell or count the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. What a promise. Your, your seed are going to be more numerous than the stars of heaven. In another place, God would say, more numerous than the sands of the sea. You, you can't count them, in other words. And he, being Abraham, believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Paul would quote this in Romans chapter 4, verse 3. And you know, believing God is extremely important to claiming his promises. If you don't believe him, if you don't trust him, you can write off those promises of blessings. You're not going to receive any. You know, that generation that wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years, when they could have gone to the promised land, why did they wander around in the wilderness for 40 years? Because they didn't trust God. They didn't believe God. And he, the Lord, said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it, the promised land. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? Give me a sign. And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. These would be sacrificed, the blood of which would seal the covenant between God and Abraham. And he took unto him all these and divided them in the midst, preparing them for sacrifice, and laid each piece one against another on the altar. But the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came, watch out for the dirty birds, uh, Satan's uh, birds are always around, came down upon the carcasses, Abraham drove them away. They were trying to eat the, what belonged to God. They tried to eat what was going to seal the covenant between Abraham and our father. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And lo, a horror or a fear or a terror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, the Lord did, Know of a surety, this is a guarantee, that thy seed shall be a stranger, a foreigner, in a land that is not theirs, Egypt by name, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. This is prophecy of Israel being in bondage to the Egyptians for four hundred years. And also that nation whom thou, they shall serve will I judge. He would judge them with ten plagues. And afterward shall they come out with great substance. When the exodus occurred, God instructed the Israelites to ask of the Egyptians precious stones, precious metals, and they were given to them abundantly. Of course, they were owed for 400 years of free labor. Verse 15, And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. Abraham was born, according to Bullinger, in 1996 B.C. 
He died in 1821 BC, 175 years later. But in the fourth generation, four generations from Abraham, was the generation of Moses. They shall come hither again, the promised land, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed, uh, that passed between those pieces, the sacrifices on the altar being accepted by fire from our Heavenly Father. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt, from the Nile, unto the great river, the river Euphrates, which always formed the border of Babylon. Now we have a listing of the enemies of our Heavenly Father. The Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Cadmonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Raphiums and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites. The latter would be those who would uh, build Jerusalem back when it was called Jebus in, in the original city. But we see in that scripture that God promised that he would be a shield a protector to Abraham. David learned at a very early in life that the Lord was his shield of protection, protection that David often needed. Turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 22 as we continue our study. Second Samuel chapter 22, verse 1. And David spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord had delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. This uh, 22nd chapter of Second Samuel is repeated almost verbatim in Psalm 18. It's a, a song of victory. And you can almost see a kinship uh, between the song of Moses, in which we find in Deuteronomy chapter 32, and this song of victory of David. And he said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. That's a mouthful. The Lord is my rock. And I mentioned the song of Moses we learn in Deuteronomy 32, 31, that there are two rocks. Our rock is not their rock. Our rock is Jesus Christ. That's a firm foundation. That's a foundation you can stand on, beloved. Their rock, of course, is Satan. The God of my rock, in him will I trust he is my shield, my gain. He is my protector. And the horn, always symbolic of power or strength, of my salvation, my high tower, and my refuge. My Savior, thou savest me from violence. That would be a good verse for you to remember when, as you're being delivered up before the Antichrist. You see... God is your refuge. I don't care where you are, what you're doing, how difficult the circumstances are, you can always go into that place of refuge. A place, he's given you a place to hide, a place to, of protection. I will call on the Lord who is worthy to be praised. He's the only one. So shall I be saved from mine enemies. When the waves or the pangs of death compass me, the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. We're going to have some floods in our future. You can read about them in Revelation chapter 12, 
verse 15. The flood is the flood of Satan's lies. The sorrows or cords of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me or were before me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried to my God. And he did hear my voice out of his temple and my cry did enter into his ears. The first thing you want to do when you find yourself distressed, cry out to your heavenly Father. He hears you. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of heaven moved and shook because he was wroth. You can read about this in Jeremiah chapter 4 where God shook the earth. He's going to shake the earth again and not only is he going to shake earth, he's going to shake heaven as well as it's written in uh, Hebrews chapter, excuse me, Revelation uh, chapter 12 verse 29. I'm sorry, I missed that scripture there. Anyway, always remember he hears you. Hebrews 12, 26, I'm sorry, is the scripture I was looking for where he will shake earth and heaven this next time. Verse 9, there went up a smoke out of his nostrils and fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. Our Father is a consuming fire. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. He bowed the heavens also and came down. Anyone want to fly away? Father's coming down. And darkness was under his feet. Darkness always symbolic of Satan. And that's where Satan belongs is under, always is under the feet of our heavenly father. He gave you power to put them under your feet as well, as we'll see later in this lecture. And he, referring to God, rode upon a cherub and did fly. Remember the vehicles, the amber-colored vehicles, Ezekiel chapter 1? He did fly. And he was seen upon the wings of the wind. Psalm 104.3, he walked on the wings of the wind. And he made darkness pavilions round about him, dark waters and thick clouds of the sky. It's going to be a dark day for his enemies uh, when it's time for them to be paid what they deserve. Through the brightness before him were coals of fire kindled. And again, that fire that can consume anything. To you, it's the Shekinah glory. The, the, the warmth that you feel in your heart when the Holy Spirit touches you. The Lord thundered from heaven and the Most High uttered his voice. And he sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and discomfited them. Hailstones the size of a talent will fall. The enemy doesn't have a chance, beloved. It's going to be over. Haman, Gog, and, and Armageddon are going to be over within five. I, I don't think it'll last five minutes. I mean, who can stand against hailstones the size of a talent? And he who has that power has promised you that he will be your shield. And the channels of the sea appeared. The foundations of the world, the ages of the world, were discovered at the rebuking of the Lord, at the blast of the breath, the ruach in the Hebrew, of his nostrils. He sent from above, he took me. He drew me out of many waters. What are waters symbolic of in Revelation chapter 17, verse 15? Waters are symbolic of the people. This, this verse also made me think about Moses. What does Moses' very name mean? Drawn of the waters. Exodus chapter 2, verse 10. He delivered me from my strong enemy and from them that hated me, for they were too strong for me. 
Goliath come to mind? David was 16, maybe 17. And he went up against the champion of Gath, a giant, no less, by the name of Goliath. He was, Goliath was too strong for David. But you know what David said to Goliath? Well, let me back up. Goliath said, come out here, boy. I'm going to give your flesh to the fowls of the air. What did David say? Goliath, you come in the name uh, with your sword and your spear and your shield, but I come in the name of Yahweh, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. You're going to be going up against something pretty strong too when you're delivered up before the Antichrist. He's going to be too strong for you if you try and take him on by yourself. Don't be foolish. Don't be foolish. The Lord is your strength. They prevented or they preceded. They got in my face would be a good way to put this. In the day of my calamity, my trouble, but the Lord was my stay. There's a locust army in our future. The sting of a locust paralyzes the victim. It turns the victim's backbone to mush. God can be your stay. He can give you backbone when your backbone fails. Revelation chapter 9 verse 5 is where you can read about the sting of the scorpion. He brought me forth also into a large place, a safe place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. And you know why God delights in you? Because you love him and he returns that love. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands hath he recompensed me. We all get exactly what we deserve from our Heavenly Father. It can be rewards. It can be chastisement and punishment. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. Was David perfect? No, David wasn't perfect. And guess what? You aren't either. I'm not either. We, we just all fall short in the flesh. And David fell short in the flesh. But one thing David never, ever did was worship another God. He was faithful to our Heavenly Father. All the other kings of Judah, most of the other kings of Israel were compared to David as far as their faithfulness and their true uh, following of Yahweh. For all his judgments were before me, and as for his statutes, I did not depart from them. I was also upright before him, and have kept myself from mine iniquity. Iniquity, another word for sin. I repented. That's what we do today under this dispensation of grace. We repent. The sin is gone. Therefore the Lord hath recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his eyesight. And did that say in my own eyesight? No, in his eyesight. And you know what that means? That means he's watching with the merciful, thou wilt show thyself merciful. With those who are kind, I will be kind. And with the upright man, thou wilt show thyself upright. Don't overlook that verse. You know what it means? It means you have the ability to control your relationship with Father. He's always the same. He's the same yesterday, the same today, the same tomorrow. But our conduct, your conduct, affects 
God's conduct toward you. That relationship is something that I encourage you to work on daily. It's very, very important. With the pure thou wilt show thyself pure, and with the froward thou wilt show thyself unsavory. Leviticus chapter 26, verse 23, the blessings and curses of God. God says there, if you walk contrary to me, I'll walk contrary to you and multiply your sins seven times, your punishment seven times. And the afflicted people, the humble people, wilt, thou wilt save, but thine eyes are upon the haughty that they mayest, thou mayest bring them down. Exalt yourself, prepare to be abased. Humble yourself and prepare to be exalted. For thou art my lamp, he's the light of the world. O Lord, and the Lord will lighten my darkness. When you're walking down the wrong path, allow him to lighten your path where you can see the danger of going the wrong way. For by thee I have run through a troop, I've broken through a troop of the enemy. By my God have I leaped over a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. It's truth. The word of the Lord is tried. It's refined. He is a buckler. There we have it, that small shield. To all them that trust in him. Did you notice the condition there? He is a shield to those who trust in him. You have a choice. You can go into the promised land with God as your shield or you can wander around in the wilderness for 40 years. Why? Because they didn't trust God. For who is God? Capital G. Save the Lord. And who is a rock? Save our God. You want to be standing on that rock. God is my strength and power and he maketh my way Perfect. You know, the only thing that's perfect about me is the Jesus Christ that's within me. I, I often pray that, that, that God will forgive the other parts of me that aren't perfect. Because, believe me, we have a lot of parts that aren't perfect. A lot of attitudes, a lot of emotions, a lot of ways of thinking that are not perfect. He maketh my feet like hinds feet. He makes me run like a deer and setteth me upon my high places. He took David from a shepherd boy and made him king over the most powerful nation on earth at the time, Israel. He teacheth my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken in mine arms. Allow God to teach your hands to war. And that's not so much as a physical war as it is a spiritual war. You see, beloved, we got a war going on right now. And yeah, there are wars in the world that are physical. But the war we need to be concerned about is a spiritual war. We don't war against flesh and blood. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation. There you have it. And thy gentleness hath made me great. God's truth shall be our shield and buckler. Turn over to Psalms 91 as we continue our study. Psalms 91. Excuse me, I missed that. Let's go another psalm first, and that is Psalm 5, please. <clears throat> Verse 
<clears throat> those of you who have studied the Psalms with me, you know that the superscriptions, the titles, if you will, that you see to the chief musician upon Nehiloth, actually that's a subscription and belongs to the previous Psalm, Psalm 4. The title or superscription to Psalm 5 is a Psalm of David. This is entitled, if you called it by a name, would be a morning prayer. Give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my meditation. This spoken in, in meditatively and in devotion. We're going to see that David is in Jerusalem at this time as he has access to the tabernacle. Verse 2, hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for unto thee will I pray. Do you talk to your heavenly Father? You know, I mentioned earlier about developing that relationship, your relationship with your heavenly Father. That's an excellent way to develop that relationship in prayer, talking to your Father meditatively, devotionally. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee, and I will look up. That's a good way to start the day, beloved, in prayer. And looking up means he's expecting a response. For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness, neither shall evil dwell with thee. We learn in James chapter 1, verse 13, that God cannot be tempted by evil, nor tempteth he any man with evil. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. Leasing is falsehoods, uh, such as rapture uh, comes to mind. Uh, those who spend uh, the first weekend in April talking more about Easter egg hunts than they do talking about Passover. The Lord will abhor, that's loathe, the bloody and the deceitful man, that's murderers and those who lie. <clears throat> but as for me, I will come into the house in the multitude of thy mercy. And in thy fear or reverence will I worship toward thy holy temple. Again, we see David in Jerusalem at the time. <clears throat> lead me, O Lord. That's a good thing to pray for. Ask God to lead you. In thy righteousness because of mine enemies. Make thy way straight before my face. Don't let me get sidetracked, Lord. And you know what will sidetrack people faster than anything? It's replacing the word of God with the traditions of men. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. I'm referring to the man, man of verse 6. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat, for what comes out of it, what they say, is an open sepulcher, a grave. They flatter with their tongues. They're smooth talkers, but if you really listen to what they say, they're wicked. Destroy thou them, O God. Let them fall by their own counsels. Cast them out in the multitude of their transgressions, for they have rebelled against thee. And you know that's what was wrong with the uh, folks who wandered in the desert for 40 years. They rebelled against God. They said, let's appoint a captain to lead us back into Egypt. They made a golden calf to be their God. But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. That's you, beloved. Let them ever shout for joy, because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. Verse 12, For thou, Lord, wilt bless the righteous. With favor wilt thou compass him as with a shield. 
And this word is shield is put for the, the largest type of shield. As I mentioned, as I intro that chapter, truth shall be our shield and buckler. Let's turn to Psalm 91 as we continue our study. <clears throat> Psalm 91 written to Messiah uh, to, and to those that are his. Uh, rest is provided in Messiah as we learn in, in Hebrews chapter 7. He is our Sabbath. He is our rest. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That's the protection of the Almighty. This word abide is, is very similar to the Greek word mone, as you find in John chapter 14 where we mansion with God. You abide with God. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God in Him will I trust. If you don't trust Him, you can't claim His promises. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 26 the snare, the traps. There's one that's even of the devil. And from the noisome pestilence, the ruinous plague. He shall cover thee with his feathers. Sound like Deuteronomy 32, 11, where as a mother eagle lifts up her young. And under his wing shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. His word is our shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror of the night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, that death angel that walked in darkness through Egypt, taking the firstborn nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. The destroyer is coming, but you have power over him in the name of Jesus Christ. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand. It's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. The whole world will be deceived by the Antichrist except for those written in the Lamb's book of life. But it shall not come nigh thee. Why? Because you're not deceived. You know who the Antichrist is. You're not going to fall down and worship him like the rest of the world. You're going to stand. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. There's an acrostic psalm, Psalm 37. And in verse 34, it states there that those who aren't deceived are going to see the enemy cast off and destroyed. Where does Satan go? Satan goes into the lake of fire. I've heard a lot of people say, you know, I wouldn't really want to see that. Give me a front row seat, please. I've seen what he's done to many, many of my brothers and sisters in Christ. You get what you deserve, and he is going to deserve the lake of fire. Verse 9, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation place of refuge. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee. Matthew chapter 18 verse 10. Your angel has the face of God at any time to keep thee in all thy ways. This might sound familiar. Matthew chapter 4. 
where Satan attempted to tempt Christ. They shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. What did Jesus, uh, Satan do? He took Jesus to the highest point in the temple. He said, jump! The Lord promised his angels would bear thee up. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, don't tempt God. There's something called gravity. And if you jump off of a high point, the law of gravity is going to kick in. I guarantee it. Don't tempt God. Of course, Satan twisted the scripture a little bit there in Matthew chapter 4. Lest at any time, he said, thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder. You know what the adder is. That's a snake, the serpent. The young lion and the dragon, that old dragon, shalt thou trample under feet. Luke chapter 10, verses 18 and 19. Jesus gave us power over all of our enemies in his name. Because he, this is Christ, has set his love upon me, the Lord speaking, therefore will I deliver him, I will set him on high, because he hath known my name. All the way to the right hand of the throne is where Jesus is. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble, even the day of Jacob's trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, how about eternal life, will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. If you plan to stand against the Antichrist, which I know many of you do, you better have the gospel armor on in place. In conclusion, and I know most of you knew I was going there next, Ephesians chapter 6, the gospel armor. I talked with my niece uh, Friday or Saturday about her Sunday school message. And she goes, I'm going to talk about the armor of God. I said, well, there you go. That's the Holy Spirit of work because I'm going to talk about the armor of God too. Here we go. Let's pick it up. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Again, don't try and take Satan on yourself. You'll fail. You've got to have the strength you got to have the power of Almighty God, and you'll have power over all your enemies. As Paul would say in, in one of his books, when I'm weak, then I am strong. Why? Because that's when you turn it over to your Heavenly Father. That's when you become as strong as Him. That's how strong you better be when you go up against Satan. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles, that's the deceit of the devil. Not fly away, stand. For we wrestle, we war, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness, in high places, the highest place even. Satan is in heaven. Not going to be forever. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7, Michael's going to give him the boot out of heaven onto earth. And then it's woe unto you on earth, unless you got the gospel armor on. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, the day of Jacob's trouble, having done all to stand. Beloved, the armory is open, but you have to step up and put that armor on. You have to take that action. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. What's truth? God's word, of course 
and having on the breastplate of righteousness. That means believing in the Lord, trusting in the Lord. The choice is yours. You can have the shield protecting you to fend off those fiery darts of Satan. Or you can wander around in the wilderness for 40 years. You got to trust him. You got to believe in him. That generation did not. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What's the gospel? The gospel is the good news. Put on your boots. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps if you're down. Preparation of the gospel. Do your homework. Do your research. Study God's word. That's how you prepare. Above all. That's, this means most importantly. Taking the shield of faith. Wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. That's the shield you need in the war against Satan and his And take the helmet of salvation. The shield of faith and the helmet are Jesus Christ. And the sword of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, which is the Word of God. That Word that Jesus Christ will speak. Revelation chapter 1 verse 16. That two-edged sword that cuts both ways. The truth cuts Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Saints are his elect. Conclusion. And for me, the utterance. Check out this word utterance. It's logos. You know what logos is? It's the Word. It's Christ, the living Word. May be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. A lot of God's Word is a mystery to those who aren't taught. If you ask them, what about the, the three world ages? They don't have a clue. Why? They haven't been taught. You are fortunate. I am fortunate. I have been taught about the three world ages. I know that I'm going to be delivered up before the Antichrist. I know if I trust and believe in God, that he will be my shield of protection when that occurs. Others you're going to be falling down, worshiping the Antichrist. Why? They haven't been taught. So, again, the choice is yours, beloved. You can trust and believe in him, and he'll be your shield, or you can wander around in the desert for 40 years. There won't be a promised land for you. And I'm talking about heaven. Let's go to his throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for your written word. Your word that tells us how to be pleasing to you, Father. You have a group here, Father, that does want to be pleasing to you, Father. We ask you to continue to reveal your will through your word, through the Holy Spirit, your spirit, Father. Lead us, guide us, direct us. We're always careful to give you the praise. Let everything we do the rest of this day be a reflection of the love that is Jesus Christ. In Jesus' precious name, amen. The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. 
The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 3, verse 14 God said to Solomon, if you walk in my ways and keep my commandments, I will give you length of days. So that's in God's control. There's no question about that. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> excuse me, some people, uh, you know, are killed in an accident and accidents happen. Uh, Jesus taught us about the Tower of Siloam that fell and killed 18 people. And he asked, he said, were those 18 people any bigger sinners than anyone else? And the answer to that was no. In the lesson, accidents happen. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't have a name here. Oh, here we go. Lola in Oklahoma. My question, how do I forgive or forget the things that has happened to me in the, and the ones who are responsible uh, are already dead. Please give me some scripture to read that would help me. Please pray for me. I'm 77 years old and need to get some of the load off my back. And that exactly right there, Lola, is what's important about forgiving. You see, you're walking around with a load on your back and you know it. Uh, what you need to do is forgive. I tell you, people who don't forgive, oftentimes they end up paying a heavier price than the person who transgressed against them, trespassed against them. Why? Because what starts off as a little watermelon seed in their throat uh, germinates and grows and grows. And before you know it, they got the whole watermelon in their throat. And that's not healthy. You, you need to forgive. And you ask for scripture, Matthew chapter 6, verse 14 and 15, gives us a very good reason that we should forgive others. That is that if we forgive others of their trespasses, God will forgive us of our trespasses. We like to tend to think that we're perfect. Well, I've got a news flash for you. None of us is perfect. We all sin. We all fall short. We all need God's forgiveness. In that case, we all should forgive those who trespass against us. Uh, on that subject, though, let me say that uh, forgiving does not mean forgetting. Uh, if, you, if someone physically harms you and then you forgive them and then you turn around and act like everything's okay, that would be foolish because they've already proven once that they will do physical harm and abuse you. So you don't put up with abuse. You're, you're not, uh, Christians are not second class citizens. Uh, you must forgive, but that does not mean forget. <clears throat> Diane from North Carolina. Could you please explain John chapter five, verses 28 and 29 uh, and that states there that uh, soon all uh, will hear his voice. Now, what Jesus was saying, and this was just before the crucifixion, and what he was telling them is before too long, after the crucifixion, in other words, uh, those who are uh, dead will hear my voice. Now, the dead are the spiritually dead <clears throat> that he goes to the prisoners in First Peter chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. And in other words, all, all that had died before would hear his voice. Uh, you see, it wouldn't have been fair for God to judge uh, the people that died before the crucifixion equally with those after, those who lived under the dispensation of the law concern, compared to those who lived in the dispensation of grace, which is the time after Christ paid the price on the cross. So uh, Jesus went and taught the gospel, the good news, 
to those that had died all the way back to Noah's time. As it states in 1 Peter chapter 4, many believed. Sue in New York, <clears throat> can you please explain the significance of the number three, especially as it relates to Peter, uh, the cock crowed three times, uh, Jesus asking him if he loved him and telling him to feed his sheep. Well, I don't know that the meaning of the number directly relates to the scripture you're talking to, but I guess you could say that it would. I think that would stretch. The number three in biblical numerics is resurrection and divine completeness and perfection is what the number three is relating to. John in West Virginia, <clears throat> I have a question I hope you can help me with, okay? Uh, coming from Native American ancestry, Cherokee, you have in parentheses, I would like to know where in the Bible it tells about the Native American people. Thanks and may God bless you all. I mentioned earlier that there were people who were created in Genesis chapter one, the sixth day creation. We refer to them here at the chapel. Um, they are, uh, God was very pleased with that creation as it states in the last verse. Native American Indians are part of that generation. By the way, we offer a book here at the chapel called North American Sun Kings. I would encourage anyone of Native American ancestry to order that book. Out of time, I love you all a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying God's Word in depth. It makes your Father's Day when you take time to read the letter he wrote to you, the Bible. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing most important, beloved, it's this. You stay in his word every day. Every day in your Father's word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? It's because Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.